builders and developers are not in the business to, to fight the existing zoning laws. It takes too much time, too much effort, too much money. And so... It turns out that it's not just the market, but regulations that shape our communities. The story of sprawl began in the 1930s. Times were hard, it was the Great Depression. In order to make it easier for Americans to buy homes, Franklin Roosevelt created the Federal Housing Administration. The FHA insured bank loans for homes, making it possible for the first time for citizens to buy a house with just 10% down. But there were a couple of rules. It had to be a nice home in a good neighborhood. The government defined that to mean things like a certain minimum setback from the street, no stores, just single family houses, space between buildings, and new construction was favored over older houses. This meant that the house your parents and grandparents grew up in just wouldn't do. And if you happen to be black, forget about it. Naturally, this was disastrous for city neighborhoods. But in the boom years following the Second World War, it created thousands of acres of white middle-class suburbs on the fringe of every metropolitan area. In 1954, President Eisenhower appointed a commission to study the need for new highways. To head the committee, he appointed General Lucius Clay, a member of the Board of General Motors. Two years later, the Interstate Highway Act authorized 41,000 miles of new highways with the federal government picking up 90% of the tab. Meanwhile, public transportation systems got no support and many went bankrupt. In the same way, the government subsidized new water and sewer systems in semi-rural areas and neglected urban infrastructure. To add insult to injury, the government built all its subsidized housing for the poor in the cities. Instead of encouraging diversified neighborhoods with equal opportunities for all, this concentrated poverty in inner city neighborhoods. Some of these projects have proved so unlivable that they've been abandoned. Here's an example of still another good idea going awry. In 1980, new federal environmental regulations made the owners of vacant industrial properties responsible to clean them up to almost pristine Garden of Eden standards before redeveloping them. As a result, it's far cheaper to build on farmland in the country than to reuse prime real estate in the city like this. Policies like this, once they're put in place, are really hard to change. In Pennsylvania, a lot of the bad planning of the past is effectively nailed in place by zoning laws. We're in Allegheny County here where Pittsburgh is located. Allegheny County has 128 individual municipalities. As in many other states, each local municipality does its own zoning with little or no cooperative planning or regional oversight. In Allegheny County, that means there must be zones to accommodate 128 strip malls, 128 corporate centers, 128 landfills, not to mention 128 of every kind of residential development from apartments to resorts. So if Walmart wants to build a store right here in the middle of a farm field and the municipality wants to say no, state law says this little municipality has to find some other spot to put it, even though there may be six other Walmarts within 20 miles. Thanks to this crazy quilt zoning system, suburban municipalities continue to attract development while cities like Pittsburgh continue to lose it. What all these policies add up to is a huge historic government subsidy for suburban living. It's no wonder Pennsylvania's countryside has gotten all built up and its city neighborhoods neglected. The real wonder when you think about it is that our cities have survived at all.